bandwidth for change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com. Hallo, ich bin Alexander Neumann und es ist Go Time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of Go Time. Today's episode is number 48. Today's show is sponsored by TopTal, and on the show today, uh, we have myself, Eric St. Martin. Unfortunately, Carlicia could not make it, but Ashley McNamara was so gracious to join us. Hello, I am not a replacement for Carlicia. She is great. Hi, I know you're listening wherever you are. Yes, she will start listening here soon. I'll only say sh- once. There it is. <laughs> Do you have your, your she- Just sheet sheet? <laughs> <laughs> And then we have Brian Kettleson here, although he does not sound like Brian Kettleson. I don't. I like the nasal version of Brian Kettleson. Hey, sorry about that. He's, uh, he's um, auditioning for the next Mucinex commercial. <laughs> I'm on my <laughs> second round of antibiotics for this, this monster thing. So one of these days, it's go away. Oh. I may or may not have given it to him. It's... Shh, you we weren't don't know supposed that to yet. tell anybody about that, Ashley. You're patient we were zero. Keep that our secret. And I think I'm patient zero. I think I gave it to everyone. I don't know. And then our special guest for today's show is Alexander Neumann. Now, I'll, I'll let you kind of lead in a little bit of kind of who you are and uh, what you're working on. But he came today to talk with us about a very cool backup program that he's written over like three years, I think you said, right? Uh, yeah, I started in uh, 2014, something like that. Um, yeah, I have a formal background in, in computer science and math, but um, I'm also a recreational programmer because I work in, in uh, InfoSec IT security as a penetration tester. So um, while it's fun to break things and being paid for it, sometimes it's also nice to like create something. And um, a few years ago, I tried to find a backup program that would suit my needs and um, discovered that basically all the backup software that I did look at at that time was either very old or broken or both. So I started a new program and um, yeah, I tried to find a project for writing something in Go. And I thought that yeah, maybe a backup program and uh, using Go for systems programming once in a while is, is a nice project. And um yeah, it turns out that really a lot of people liked it and also my colleagues liked it. And so we, with my colleagues, we went on to discuss um, the concept for this uh, backup program. This is really nice. And uh, many other people also like it. Now, Brian, you wouldn't know anything about not being able to find a backup program you like, would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say I've been using Restic for about three months now. And I oh, have awesome. a, a bash script that runs in cron that backs up locally on my laptop and then one uh, so it alternates it it does a backup to my laptop and then it does a backup to my uh, network attached storage both using restic and it is faster than hell i can't even get over how fast it is it's awesome yeah and this is uh, even uh, with with all the deduplication at work and uh, every byte that needs to be deduplicated and needs to be read is accessed at least i think three or four times so uh, yeah, I, I think one of the main differences between RESTIC and all the other backup programs is that uh, for RESTIC, the focus is really on the one hand security, but on the other hand, speed and usability because nobody wants backup, everybody wants restore, right? right. So um, backup needs to be very fast because otherwise you're, you're tempted to skip it. Um, if it's too slow or too complicated to do, then you think, oh no, I'm not going to do a backup today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. And then your hard drive burns down and all the data is lost. And I think it's very important to make, to make it very easy for users to just yeah, run a backup now and then and not, being able, not needing to think about it and how do you call this backup and so on. So it just the, the program should figure it out and I can restore my data later. That's the most important thing. And I, I'm glad you liked it. Well, I, my GoPath is 
25, 25 gigabytes, 25.1 gigabytes. And the backup <laughs> locally takes uh, less than a minute and a half. That's crazy. With all of the compression. and It's just insane. I, it makes me so happy. I really like that analogy, too, that nobody likes backup. Everybody likes restore. It's true. That's it's true. So true. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not from me. It's from uh, the admin Zen. It's a website collecting all the wisdom that administrators need to keep in mind. And this is one of them. Nobody wants backups. Everybody wants restore. I like it. Yeah. So why did you choose Go? Um, to be honest, it's just I was in need of a project to like learn Go and have a look at the language. Um, I've used several languages before, starting with like Pascal at Delphi when I was in, in, in school. Wow, Delphi. Oh, yeah. Uh, Delphi on, uh, I think, Windows 95 or something like that. I, I did <laughs> a lot of, of things with Delphi. There was a uh, Trojan horse that I used to hack on back in the 90s that was written in Delphi. <laughs> Was it was it sub seven maybe? Uh, the Trojan. I, yeah, the Trojan. Uh, this one was called Deep Throat, I think. I forget what back orifice was written in. Oh my god! I think it was can, it was C. Can but we I, I used to say like, <laughs> <laughs> this is a family friendly show. Nerd so hard right now. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley and I are just going to take a break and blow our noses while you guys have your little nerdgasms with all of these <laughs> sexually connotated penetration testing names. Yes. Back mm -hmm. with this. That term didn't even exist in the 90s, though. Yeah, so Go was just a tool for, for getting the job done. I would like to have a, a backup program. And um, this was basically, I started to, to scratch my own itch. And yeah, Go came along and I would like to do something in Go. So... It was Go, but uh, to be honest, I really like the community and so on. But the most important part of, of this Rustic Backup Program project is not the code itself and also not the programming language. But for a backup program, the most important part is that you can always restore the backups, even like 10 years in the future, something like that. So I started developing some things and trying out this, this cool deduplicating algorithm that I found in an old math paper. and um, then I basically started and wrote um, a detailed design document for the server-side storage for all the data that is to be backed up. Because um, usually my programs, at least before RESTIC, tend to be like I'm hacking on things and the specification is the code. But this is not a good idea when you plan to like restore from a repository that has been created like 10 years before for maybe that the code doesn't compile anymore. We have like Go 3, which is not backwards compatible to Go 1. Um, so it's very important to like have this specification, which is separate from the, the actual code. And somebody even started a Python implementation for the repository format and so on. Oh, well, that's neat. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Well, I have to say, looking at the repo, one of the things that we do before the show, you know, we, we've got to go in and look at the source code. And you have committed <laughs> your vendor directory and mm -hmm. I say kudos to you, my friend. Kudos to you for creating that vendor repository. That is awesome. I think as a person who's binary, you should commit that, that vendor directory if you want to have reproducible builds. And your whole point is to have uh, nice, simple, easy builds for the people who are using Rustic. So good job. Thank you. Um, this is actually one of the things that took some time to create like a binary that can be described completely by the GitHub commit ID that is uh, currently checked out in the, in the branch. So um, the other thing that's in, in RESTIC that's a bit different from, from other projects, uh, maybe other projects like, like Camly Store and Docker already also have that, we have a, a build script called build.go. So you, at the moment, you cannot install RESTIC by using go get. Um, and this is, some part of that is intentional because when I'm using go get, then I don't have any information when this binary was, was built and which code exactly was built into the binary, apart from the timestamp of the binary itself. But the uh, build script uses the uh, vendor dependencies and also includes the commit ID or the version number uh, in the final binary. And in the GitHub issue template, I have this, this slot for please insert the output of RESTIC version here. And there's everything you need. There's the uh, build timestamp, there's the commit ID, there's the version number, there's the Go version and the operating system and architecture. And 
this proved really valuable over time because sometimes people tend to build strange setups or strange things. And I, will, I was always able to like pin down the exact software version um, somebody was running. And this was really helpful. So, so you did this project like just to learn, learn Go or was there a specific use case for yourself that you were trying to solve for? Yeah, my I, I, I primarily I would like to solve my personal use case, which is a like twenty or twenty five gigabytes directory in my home directory called shared, and I would like to create a backup of it uh, at least once a day, even even better when it's more than once a day. Um, and I would like to keep very a, a lot of revisions of this shared directory because that's I'm working in my Go passes in there, my all the projects are in there, um, so I would really archive this directory a lot of times and it should also also be possible to not only save this backup like on the local machine because when the hard drive dies or the ssd dies then everything is gone uh, but also like put it on a server uh, somewhere and um, being able to restore from the server when the ssd dies the problem with that is that i have access to many different servers but usually these are not for my exclusive use and these are even located somewhere like in a data center or there's an, an, a co-administrator who has always also has a, like root access. And so this needs to be taken into account and uh, RESTIC has a defined threat model. And one of the things that this model defines is that um, the storage location for the RESTIC repository where all the data is saved um, isn't necessarily completely trusted, which means that there may be a co-administrator or there may be an attacker who has access to this system. And what the only thing that uh, such people can do is like remove files or destroy the repository, but they shouldn't be able to decrypt my files or get any information about the data that I back up. And especially uh, I would like to notice when somebody changes things or tinkers around with a file saved in there. And this is also a nice property because uh, for RESTIC, I'm saving all the data in so-called pack files, which is a combination of smaller data blobs, and they are saved on some server. And this, the name for the for the file is the SHA-2 hash sum of the contents. So on a server, you can easily like set up a cron job and regularly compute the SHA-2 hash of the file and compare it with the file name, and you instantly know that uh, the file has been changed in, on the on the storage medium, so that you can detect bit rot, for example. That sounds really um, similar to the way Git files are stored with the pack right. files. Right. Yeah, this is the, the design of RESTIC is very heavily inspired by Git and BUP and so on. And I think there are so many good ideas in, in these designs. So I just had a look at it and took the part that can be applied to backup at my, my storage location. And that worked really, really briefly. Were you expecting it to become so popular so quickly? And like... Now, how are you dealing with like contributors and releases and like was it was it an accidental burden at some point? I don't know what you what, what do you mean by burden? Uh, you know, like when you accidentally create something that's really great and then everyone wants more and more and more of your time and you didn't realize <laughs> that you didn't have any time. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, go first. Yeah. I was not expecting for it to be so popular, but it seems that I was not alone in my uh, in the result of my research for a good backup program. So um, I'm trying to dampen the enthusiasm of the contributors a bit um, because I this is a weekend or recreational project for me, uh, and I don't have any plans for like to commercialize it also or something like that. So um, in terms of like support requests. There haven't been so many, but there have been several companies that would like to to use it. And it, I mean, it, it's BSD licensed, so um, they can just use it. But um, they cannot expect for me to to give them support apart from what support I can give in my in my spare time. So sometimes you need to be very direct and honest to people creating issues. Something like, oh, we are building a Kubernetes integration for for Restic. Um, how much support can you give us? And I try to be direct and honest so that they know. Zero. Yeah, so that they know what they can expect. And uh, that's that's where you say, 
that fork button is right up on the top on the right there. Just hit that little fork button right there. there <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah, exactly. It's all you, baby. It's it's very awesome that that people sit down and fork the project and create their own add-ons and their own backends. And there have been several proposed backends, for example, in the in the in the past. Um, for example, there's this uh, we support at the moment a local backend where all the backups are just stored in the local file system. We support SFTP because that is that's what I'm primarily using. And we also support S3 with, with Minio, so you can uh, run a Minio server or use uh, AWS S3 for storage, which is really popular. And people have already suggested that it may be a good idea to support like Backblaze, which is a backup storage company by itself, but they also have an API for like blob storage. And somebody created such a backend code for Rustic, but unfortunately, it was um, yeah, it was not not good enough in terms of the project wasn't ready to accept this this backend. So this uh, pull request was closed. And I'm I really like what what uh, people are doing with this maintainer Rati stuff. That's that's yeah something that that resonates with me a lot because sometimes you need to to tell people I value your contribution, but I'm not going to merge it. Right. And this is not so easy. No, it's very difficult. Now, I like the, the Minio integration. I run Minio on my NAS at home, and I point Restic to the Minio instance that's running on my NAS, and it's just so darn fast. And I love the fact that Minio is written in Go, and I just have this tiny little binary running on my NAS, because the NAS isn't that powerful. But Minio doesn't take a lot of processing power to run in the background, so I have a nice distributed backup using Restic. You should uh, check out the latest release of Rustic, which I've done uh, in, in, I, I, a few hours ago. It's a pre-release for 0.6.0, and the uh, S3 backend support uh, it's, it's much more awesome now because I'm using a lower-level API for uh, the S3 library by Minio and was able to reduce the allocations by a factor of around 98% less allocations oh. for, for memory. Oh so. Can't try it again. <laughs> wow. It was fast before. I love it. All right. Downloading. So I know you um you have another project that basically spun out of Restic, which is what you do, kind of like you're deduping. Have you done the deduping from the beginning? Like how much less space did your backup start consuming once you kind of jumped on that? This deduplication thing was built into Restic right from the beginning because at first wow. I thought like oh I'd like to to have like a backup program and yeah that was then I started thinking about and discussing with my colleagues what should a backup program do and one one of the things that you have in a backup program you have like duplicate data either you have the same file in in different at different times um sometimes files haven't been modified so you have exactly the same data that's really easy to handle but sometimes you have like virtual machine images of like 100 gigabytes and you just have changed one or two bytes within the whole image. And it would be really a shame to let, like store these 100 gigabytes twice because most of the data is exactly the same. So I started looking into algorithms that try to detect changes or similarities in, in data. And one of the ideas that have been built into the this, this really old tool called rsync there's a, a PhD thesis by some, some somebody called Andrew, I think. I've, I've forgotten the name. Um, because rsync does really interesting things. For example, when you try to copy a file to a remote server, then on the local side, the rsync process opens the file, starts reading and sending to the remote side. And if this is canceled for, for some reason, for example, you press, uh, you, you cancel the program locally or your internet connection breaks down and Afterwards, you, you restart this process, then rsync will detect that there is some part of the file already on the remote side, will open it, and will find where it left off on the previous run. This is the easy part. But what happens when the, the file on the remote side was modified and you would like to make it pristine again and copy the original file over to the remote side again? You can just like delete the remote file and start transferring again, but that's not very efficient. So um, rsync cuts the file into different blobs and detects which blobs need to be transferred. For example, if you just changed one byte because of a hardware error on the on the HDD or something like that, then you just need to 
detect which of the blobs did change. For example, the first blob, the first, for example, thousand bytes or so, rsync will detect that and will onto transfer this small amount of, of data and reconstruct the file on the remote side. And the algorithm that it uses is called a, a rolling hash sum. It starts by reading the file and taking all the subsets of 32 bytes, I think, from the file. And for each of these 32 bytes, it computes a hash. And when this hash has a, 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 some, some property, for example, the, uh, the lower bits are set to zero, then it says like, oh, I found a block boundary. And afterwards, it um, uses a real hash function, a cryptographic hash function. Um, I think it uses MD5 or something like that to detect of the content of the blob has been changed. So you could have also cut the file into, into like one kilobyte pieces. But then the problem is you cannot detect when one byte has been inserted at the beginning because all your blob boundaries are wrong. And when you have like these dynamically sized blobs, then you can detect, oh, there has been a byte inserted. The first blob is different, but all the other blob markers at the end of the file are completely the same again. So um, this is really efficient to like dynamically slice a file into blobs. And this is what, what Restic does. The problem with the, uh, the, the algorithm that rsync does is that it is targeted at really, really small blobs, like for example, 100 byte or like 5,000 bytes. And in a backup program, we don't deal so much with inter-file duplication, but with intra-file duplication. Um, we have some files that are not exactly the same, but mostly the same. So it's, it's a good idea to, to have like larger blobs because when you have a snapshot that I'm doing of my, my directory now and two days from now, most of the files will be exactly the same and some will be modified, but most of the data will probably be exactly the same. So it makes sense to reduce the number of blobs that you need to handle and have like larger blobs. And RESTIC at the moment is configured to try to like have one megabyte of data is, is one blob. And this was just not possible with the algorithm that rsync uses. So I looked at, a, at an algorithm called Rabin fingerprinting. Uh, it's a really, really old idea by, by a mathematician called Rabin uh, from, from the 80s. And I read the original paper, and it was uh, typeset with a typewriter. And um, I think the, the formulas was, were manually inserted and painted in there, something like that. And I tried to understand the, the math behind it and then implemented it in Go. And it uh, turns wow. out that... The, the Go version is really, really fast already. It can do, and on my, on my laptop, it can do 150 megabyte per second per core, something like that. So that's not an issue to just like run it on all the data. And this is just the, the fingerprinting calculation, which yields blob boundaries for, for files. So at the moment, it's RESTIC starts by reading a file, piping all the bytes of this file through this algorithm to the chunker, and afterwards, there's the there, there you have like your your blobs and what it does is it uh, uses a window of like 64 bytes so it calculates a hash of like first byte to 64th byte then the second byte to 65th byte third byte to 66th byte and so on and whenever the, the hash has a certain property that enough bits are set to zero then there is a blob boundary so and um when when uh, Go was well, Go 1.6 was released, I think this was the first release of Go that really yielded another speed increment in the chunker just by building it with a newer version of Go. And the speed increments in in recent versions are impressive. Uh -huh. For example, I think in 1.7 it was that I recompiled the chunker and I gained like 10% speed just by recompiling it. It's enormous. Yeah, Go. This was this was really really great. So when when Restic then cut the file into these blobs. It will con compute a SHA-2 hash over the contents of the blob and then have a lookup table and see, is this blob already known? If not, the blob is saved to the repository. And these the blobs are bundled into PEC files and only then sent to the repository. And they are encrypted, of course, and signed and so on. This is all very, very secure. And if this blob has already been saved, then it doesn't need to do anything. It just writes a JSON file that file A was constructed by these blobs and just test the SHA-2 hashes of the blobs there. And that's it. So basically the repository for RESTIC just stores like metadata in JSON and the blobs itself. That's it. And they are encrypted and so on. So we have in the RESTIC blog, we have uh, an article about like 
digging a bit into the data structures that are there. And you can also use the RESTIC command cat, RESTIC cat, to print out the metadata JSON things so that you, you can inspect them and write small scripts to have a look around. Oh, I haven't tried that yet. Now I'm going to try that. Yeah, you should. It's it's really really easy. Uh, I will I will insert the 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 blog entry URL later in the show notes. This is so cool. Thank you. It really is. I love I love how you can do snapshots and you can just list the snapshots. Show me all the snapshots that I have over time. Of course, mine are hourly, so I've got a lot of snapshots, but they don't take up a ton of space because of the deduplication. That's it's a it's an awesome thing. Yeah, if you have a new snapshot and you have changed a file and the file has like one megabyte of data changed, then your snapshot should not take much more than this one megabyte of changed data. And that's it. Have you tried the fuse mount yet? I have not tried the fuse mount yet, but it's like oh, kind, you kind, of, kind of like having ZFS, but without having to fight with ZFS. <laughs> you can tell Restic to like present all the snapshot in uh, this directory via fuse. And then you can browse around in your snapshots and data is only fetched on demand so that you can have like a thousand snapshots stored in S3 somewhere and just browse around and have a look at what, the, what are the timestamps of the snapshots. Then you can use CD and your shell tools, like uh, find files or play video or whatever that just works. And it's Shut really, really the great. Front door. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. That's, that's it. Super cool. I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of the show playing around with the rest of command line. You guys have a nice show. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> I suppose I should really set up backup for my uh, workstation. Oh, yeah, 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 you should. <laughs> yeah, I also need to do that. It's, it's on my to-do list where it's been for a couple of years. It's been on everyone's to-do list, though, for the same reason. I, uh, I feel like... Right about the time I get around to setting it up properly is about the time that I pave my machine <laughs> and then it goes back on the list. Yes. I have set up backups to several locations. It's, and it's really, really, really easy with Restic. I'm just saying. I used to back up religiously and I would back up in three locations because it's not if something fails, it's when it will fail. Um, and I'm terrible at it now. I don't know what happened. I haven't had anything catastrophic enough happen, I think. The interesting thing is that this, there are a lot of statistics around when, when SSDs fail or when hard disks fail. And personally, I haven't seen a hard disk fail like there was just one byte changed or something like that. Um, so this is very abstract for me. But recently, a user opened an issue and said like, oh, the, uh, I think it was a check command or something like that. The check command is broken for RESTIC because it says that my data is wrong. And in the, in the GitHub issue, we, we drilled it down and found out what was wrong. And there, and indeed, his hard drive started to fail and RESTIC detected it. Nice. And this was really interesting because it was the first time I saw such a yeah, silent failure in the real world. That's awesome. Yeah. There's nothing better. You know, how do you... Without using mocks or, or something like that, it's almost impossible to simulate that occurrence. So, you know, having a real world disk failure prove that your software is correct is kind of awesome. Yeah, this is something like the, the question from earlier regarding like support. Um, I had like two, two other instances where people created an issue and said like, oh, something is very, very strange here. One, one guy created, a, started using Restic and made a backup of this complete laptop, like 200 gigabyte to S3, something like that. Then he started restoring into a test directory and said like, oh yeah, this this works. Then canceled the restore and reformatted his hard drive. And afterwards he tried to restore the data from S3 and Restic kept telling him, oh no, the password is wrong. And then he created an issue. And at first I was like, yeah, if you if you have mistyped your password, then your data is gone. There's a, a really good key derivation function that does the password to AES key conversion. So, um, and it's even, it's, it's called S-Crypt. It's even uh, uses a lot of memory to be hard against custom ASICs that can crack this. So if you lose your password, then your get data is gone for real. So I made sure that this is the case. So it's, it, but it turns out that he just had a had a typo in the S3 uh, buckets uh, path 
at, at the end. So he just had the wrong directory on F3 and the error message could be improved. And I did that afterwards and all his data was safe. And this was like, when I, when I first read this issue, when I came home from work, I said like, oh, what, what did I do? <laughs> why, why did I release software that let people uh, back up their data in, to a cloud service and so on? And this was, yeah, but the resolution was really good because he just logged into the S3 uh, console and uh, saw that it was the wrong directory and every, everything was fine. And um, this, was, this was really interesting. That brings up a valid point, though. Like that, that is a little scary to to hand stuff over to people and know that you're responsible for kind of their data. Well, I mean, it's open source, but still. Yeah, I'm not really responsible in terms of the license because it says like uh, this is the BSD license, and it says like there is no warranty at all at your own risk and so on. But as a person, you feel, yeah, as a you feel guilty if some something happened, you know. Yeah. Exactly. You may not be legally liable, but I think, you know, we all want to produce things that make people's lives better, you know. So finding out that there was something catastrophic caused by something you wrote, like, always hits people close to home. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that you should feel awesome when somebody has a catastrophic failure and the backups work and they restore their data to a new system. So, you know, the 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 corollary to that is that you should you should get to feel awesome pretty often because people are restoring backups. Exactly. I, I do because people are creating backups. And this is so much better than not having backups at all. It must be really, really easy to do backup because otherwise nobody does it. And when I started with Restic, I had a look around and had tried different backup programs and there was this this old yeah, the, this this old approach to doing backups where you have to decide, do I do a full backup or an incremental backup? And this was mental workload that I, as a user, would just like to create a backup. I, I, I'm not interested in, in making this decision every every time I do a backup. Oh, it's and this was, so annoying. It's the reason oh, why yes. we don't do backups. You're right. I guess that was one of the reasons I love Time Machine. You know, the first time I got a Mac with that on there, where it was like, I, I only had to tell it where to store the the backup data. And from there, it kind of just did its thing. Yo, you guys, I lost my Synology in the divorce. Sad times for me. <laughs> and uh, my time machine is like, you haven't backed up in like 600 days or something like that. I'm like, yeah, I know. Way to remind me, guys. <laughs> it's time to get a new NAS. I know. I can do better this time on both accounts, probably. <laughs> yeah, so after having a bit of, of research done for, for other backup programs, um, I started a list of, of backup programs, of open source backup programs that work on Linux. And um, I keep discovering new ones. And the list already has like 80 or 90 entries, something like that. It's, it's on uh, GitHub slash Restic slash others. And I'd even discovered that there was a, a program with very with a very similar design called Attic. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't actively developed anymore, but because the original author, author, I think, lost interest or something like that, and it was forked to uh, another backup program called Borg, like the Borg from Star Trek. Uh, this is written in Python mostly, and um, had already is also a C component and uses OpenSSL for the crypto. And this is also very nice, but sometimes the workflow is not so great because when you create a backup and there's this like fork create command, then you need to give it a name. And every time I am trying to use it, then I, I'm, I'm thinking around, the, what, what, what's the name for that? My backup or is it Monday or is it my awesome laptop machines backup or something like that? So this is, this is where users stumble when they just need to save some files. I like the workflow of Restic. It seems like you thought through nicely the idea of having multiple different repositories and being able to back up to different repositories makes my life really easy. I like that a lot. As far as user interface and user experience goes, Restic is good. Okay, that's very, very nice to hear because this is really the focus of Restic. And it's hard to do in a backup software. I mean, it's backup software. It's, it's, it's not an easy thing. So it's, it's nice that Restic is... Oh, yeah, indeed. But you use Viper for the uh, command line interface, and that helps a lot too. Viper is, Viper is about as good as it gets in the command line side of things in Go. 
yeah, I thought of writing my own framework and then find, found, found Viper. And it does all that I need to do right now. But what's missing from Restic at the moment is, uh, oh no, I, I think it's Cobra is the CLI framework and Viper is the configuration framework. Oh, you're right. This this Viper thing, it's a bit scary at the moment. How I, I don't know how it how it exactly works. And in terms of configuration file, Restic doesn't have a configuration file yet because I haven't found a way to do this nicely. And then it's I, I prefer it that people write their own shell scripts to run Restic instead of like having a bad configuration file. That makes good sense. Yeah, it's good advice. Yeah, what would happen if somebody changed their key in the middle of like a backup, like just thinking of like things that could go wrong with config files. Yeah, this is an, an interesting, uh, interesting question. Um, what I was talking about was the like local configuration file where you say like, oh, this is my backend and this, this is my exclude list for this directory and so on. And when you, when you change the key in, in RESTIC, there is only just two keys for one repository. Whenever you initiate a new repository, then Restic randomly generates an, an encryption key and a signing key. And, that, and that's it. That's just symmetric keys for AES and Poly, I think, 1305 or something like that. This is the MAC algorithm. And these two keys are encrypted with a key derived from your password. So it's especially important the password is independent of, of the key. So you can, you can change your password and have still access the the old data that has been saved in the repo like weeks before. And um, so there is no, no key that you can change. There was uh, a GitHub issue of somebody who said like, oh, we need to have like cipher agility and be able to change or re-encrypt the complete repository and um, being able to use another algorithm instead of IAS. And this was something that I would not like to do because I think too many knobs for users and too many different code paths and algorithms is not a good idea, especially in a, a software program that tries to be robust. And we've seen what, what happens when you try to be more flexible than you need to be with like TLS, which still suffers from, from the old crypto algorithms that have been implemented in, in, in TLS in the, in the 90s. And we still see vulnerabilities that are caused by these old algorithms. They are disabled, but they are sh they still cause cause issues. So for Restic, I would always say that we chose a sane default and make things configurable for users that need to be. But if in doubt, there won't be a knob for it. So I think that we've probably overshot our sponsor break a little. So let's go ahead and take that real quick. So our sponsor for today is TopTal. Hey everyone, Adam Stukoviak here, Editor-in-Chief of Changelog. Our friends at TopTal have been sponsoring our podcast for years, and now they're sponsoring GoTime as well. We think they're one of the best ways to hire developers and designers, as well as one of the best ways to freelance as a software developer or designer. Head to toptal.com slash go to learn more. Tell them you heard about them on GoTime. If you'd like a more personal introduction, email me, adam at changelog.com. And now back to the show. And we are back talking to Alexander Neumann from Restic. So before we went to break, we were talking about some of the feature requests and things that you've had. Like, what's what's next for Restic? What are, what are some things that you do want to implement? Where do you see this going? Yeah, so I did the 060 release today, the, the release candidate. And so this is the, the development for, for that is done. And for the next, the next projects are getting more backends into Restic. Uh, there's a Swift backend. This is some some kind of object storage thing that you can also rent from OVH, for example. There's the uh, Backblaze backend that I would like to start working on. And there is a new version of the repository format that I would like to do because this repository format that we're using right now, it's it's yeah basically the same that I wrote like two and a half years ago. And there are some things that I would like to change. For example, I would like to support compression. Because at the moment, when, when the file is read and split into blobs, and these blobs are saved, and encrypted and saved the way they are into the repository. So having compression may be very efficient because sometimes blobs can be compressed very efficiently. And this is not supported yet, but this is one of the most requested features ever, I think. 
And other parts of the project, uh, yeah, we have a huge list of like things that need to be reworked. With it, it's the same, I think, with every every non-trivial program. One of the things is that some operations for RESTIC are not so fast as they could be. And mainly this um, is a problem that we don't cache any data locally. So RESTIC does not have any local state. All state is in the repository. And some operations like the prune operation, which goes through the list of all the blobs and looks for blobs that are not in use anymore, that are not referenced anymore. And this is very time consuming because it traverses all the tree structures in JSON and requests all the trees from the repository. So this is something that needs to be done every once in a while, and it's really, really slow. So this is something that I would like to tackle and improve a lot. And I have many ideas what what can also be made better. But uh, yeah, this is the case with, with all the open source programs out there, I think. So here's an interesting question, because there's some uniqueness to the way this application works. So how are upgrades performed? Um, is it that you've kind of pre-built into the storage layer some information for the tool to be able to kind of uh, work backwards compatible with old ways that the data was stored? Or is there some sort of like upgrade where you upgrade the, the backup so that it, it's yeah, there will be like a, a migrate command, which is able to convert a repository to a newer version, maybe also to an older version. I haven't decided that yet. Um, at the moment, and I think this is one of the most astounding things, at least for me, at the moment, the first, almost first version of the repository that I released like two and a half years ago is still working today. So we haven't really changed much over there. And the repository always has a, a configuration file, which is also encrypted so that you can check if you have locally have the, the right key to decrypt data in the repository. And there is some metadata in this file. For example, there is the repository version number. And at the moment, RESTIC tries to, to access the repository, downloads the configuration file, um, decrypts it, and checks whether the configuration file has a version number that is compatible to the currently run binary. So when we do the next version of the repository format, then there will be a two instead of a one in the version field. And then all the RESTIC instances know that this is version two of the repository. And we plan to be backwards compatible to version one so that you can still write to repositories with version one. And also for newer repositories that are initiated later, then the version two is used. And for example, this enables features like compression. but I'd like to be as, as as compatible as possible because when people start using RESTIC, then they depend on us, mostly on me in, in this case, that they are able to restore their backups um, in like 10 years or so. Um, for Go, it's really great because you can always say like, okay, you need to handle version one repositories and need to restore data from it. There's the statically linked binary from like five years ago, and you can use that. This is really great because you don't need any configuration, any libraries, any runtime, anything. It's all built into the binary. But for most part, we'd like to be as compatible as possible. That's great that you at least pre-thought of that with the version stuff. Yeah, this came out of, of many discussions with, with my colleagues at work because they all also are quick, quick thinkers. And we're also very interested in having a working backup program. So. Um, this is something that we at work we saw sometimes which which fails. For example, with with TLS version detection is a has been a problem, and this was something that was built in 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 one of the first versions. So we already have that. That's awesome. So I think we probably have about fifteen or twenty minutes left, and I know the past couple of weeks we've skipped over all the projects and news and uh, even Free Software Friday last week. Gas. I know. Wow. Um, That's a good law. So, do you guys want to jump into anything there? I know we have kind of like a lot of stuff that's probably piled up. I didn't contribute anything to the news, but I can talk to Kelsey Hightower's DevOps Day speech. Oh, you were, that's right. You were there. I was there in person crying like a baby. Oh. I skipped over the video a few minutes ago, and it seems to be that he was very agitated i haven't seen it yet he was not agitated um he was just emotional he was ex he was sharing an experience and it was very vulnerable and he 
cried and then we all cried and then we all group hugged and then we all uh, had barbecue. It was great. Well, Kelsey didn't have barbecue. I'm kidding. But it was great. Vegetarian. Yeah. I kind of feel like at this point that um, if you're not Kelsey Hightower, you're going to have a really hard time doing a great job with a keynote. And (laughs) everybody else is just, you know, not Kelsey. That's, you know, you're either Kelsey or you're not Kelsey. I mean, he deployed a Kubernetes cluster with, uh, with his voice, voice control. Okay, Google, ship it. <laughs> How the hell are we supposed to even reach that standard? We can't. You can't. You can't. There, There's only the one Kelsey. The rest of us all are just, you know, not Kelsey. I'm going to put that in my, my uh, LinkedIn, not Kelsey. It's already in my LinkedIn, and I've had 100 people endorse me for not Kelsey. <laughs> for being not so. Kelsey. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's insulting a little bit, but you know, it's it's pretty rough. So, Go one point eight point two and one point eight point three were released yesterday. Both one point eight point two was a security fix for an elliptical curve and something or other, and one point eight three had the other fixes that had been saved up since one point eight point one. I don't remember. None of them sounded really big, like compiler fixes and little things. So, fire up your downloaders and. Get up to 1.8.3. Uh, Dell also had a release candidate for their version one, which is awesome. Yes. Oh, and speaking of Delve, and in an unrelated sort of way, the well, semi-related, the uh, 0.6.60 release of Visual Studio Code has some really killer code lenses. They have Delve integration, so you can uh, hover above a test and click a button and debug a test in Visual Studio Code. That is so awesome. I just switched over to VS Code like last month, and I haven't used anything else since. It's crazy how good it is. And uh, spoiler alert, Ramya will actually be on the show next week. (gasps) That's right. Oh, that's nice. Oh, much geeking out will happen. Oh, I want to be on the show next week. (laughs) Actually, um, maybe you can because I'm teaching in San Francisco next week. But why don't you sit in for me next week, and then you could be on the show because I'm not going to be here. I just realized that. Yay! I wiggled into another show. <laughs> nice, just <laughs> like that. So, um, Gopher Fest also happened what a couple weeks ago. Um, videos are out for that on YouTube. Uh, for anybody who hasn't seen it, we'll link to that in the show notes. Well, it's crazy how much stuff has passed that we didn't get a chance to talk about because, no. yeah, we were either I think we missed we missed an episode, and then and and then got chatting a lot. So other than that, um, Fran, Frances did a state of go talk too, um, it, the May 2017 edition, um, and we can link to the slide deck of that. I didn't think that talk was very complete. My name was not mentioned once, <laughs> and I just I. I briefly look through the slides i didn't even see a link to my github repositories so i i don't feel like this is a very complete state of go talk i mean i appreciate that he you did know it. it was it was in there and then he said ashley left. and at this point in the conversation the audio just stopped recording for some reason computers am i right by the time the technical difficulties were all sorted out alexander had just begun talking about his free software friday pick rofi pass let's hear what he had to say it's an, uh, an interactive um, input thingy. You can uh, like uh, have a list of lines, pipe it into Rofi. It displays an interactive list where you can select an entry, for example, by typing one of the characters that is in there, select the entry, and it will spew out this line to stand it out. And you can use it for all kinds of shell scripts. And I'm using it for, for all my stuff and at work, and that's really awesome. And there is another shell script called Rofi Pass, which uses the passwordstore.org um, password manager. It's a really a nice thing in itself. It uses GPG, for example. And it uses um, Rofi and Pass to do interactive password logins. And it can do all kinds of things like you can have uh, in, the, in the password store, you can have a user field and the password field. And then you can go to some website, have a shortcut for Rofi Pass. It varies for... Uh, the name of the uh, of the website, and it can it can enter um, the username and the password and a tab character in between. So I don't need to do anything. To, I don't need to copy or paste any username or password. It's awesome. You guys can't see this, but in the notes, I'm assuming this is from Brian. It's all caps. It says what? Rofi Pass. Omg. 
So yeah, you know, you're a geek. When I, I saw the show notes that Rofi Pass was in here, the first thing I did was wipe my calendar clean tonight because I am setting up Rofi Pass. <laughs> I've been using, I've been using a Pass database for my passwords for uh, about three weeks now because one password doesn't have a Linux client that's useful. And I, I keep, I keep uh, tweeting at them and stuff. No. <laughs> so when I found out that there was a Rofi Pass, because I already use Rofi and it's awesome. Uh, oh, yes, Rofi it Pass, is. It just, that made my day. It might have even made my week. It's possible. But, you know, that sign when you clear your calendar because you're going to set up Rofi Pass. <laughs> it's not so much that you, you need to set up. You just need to install it, run it, and that's it because all the configuration is already done in when you have set up Pass. So you don't need to set up anything. That's true, but I still have about 400 passwords that aren't in pass yet. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, so those are, those are good ones. We will accept two this week just for that because that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that is really awesome. I haven't seen the Rofi pass. I've used Rofi for, I don't even know how I've, long. I've been using it for years, yeah. Yeah. So first it was Demon U2, and then it was Rofi. Yeah. Rofi's just fast. Well, first it was Demenu, then Demon U2. So. Yeah. When I was a kid. So my free software Friday is in the same vein, actually, because all of this to me kind of revolves around Linux and the command line and, and, and the nice X windows toys. Mine is barista, which is, uh, at github.com slash S O U M Y a 92 slash barista. And it's an I three status bar that's written in go. So you can have pretty much anything in the entire world you want in your i3 status bar if you're willing to write Go code for it. And that is really fun. So um, it's it's more of a toolkit for writing a status bar. And it also happens to give you a couple of examples of how you can make your own. But running a custom, I did it myself status bar in i3 is really awesome, especially when it's uh, written in Go. Oh, I need to check this out tonight because I'm also using i3. Oh, I knew we were going to be fast friends, Alex. <laughs> yeah, we love i3 here. Yeah, I've um, I've met the the author Michael Stapelberg at the uh, Chaos Communication Congress in Hamburg like two years two years ago, and uh, I brought I bought chocolate that was really nice. So that's nice. as a as a nice uh, little thank you present. Now I want chocolate. And now, Ashley, I know uh, I know we invited you on last minute, but did you have anybody you wanted to give a shout out to? Check out Kelsey Hightower's talk. That's all I got for Free Software Friday. I, I wouldn't say that's all you got. I mean, all the stuff Kelsey does is great. And that that whole that whole talk was like super emotional. He's been knocking it out of the park these days with his talks. There's just there's no comparison. You're either Kelsey Hightower or you're not. How how can you keep that level of quality up long term? I don't think you can I did say Visual Studio Code. Thanks, Matt. Shout out Matt. That was just so out of nowhere. <laughs> random. It was not random. It was in the it Slack channel. It was totally channel. random. Wait, uh, just because it was in the Slack channel doesn't mean that everybody else has you context. You have to be there. Ashley. You have to be there. So my free software Friday is actually a person. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Brendan Gregg, who is a performance engineer at Netflix. And uh, on his website, brendangregg.com, or his book, or the many like talks he's done that are on YouTube, uh, for like profiling and performance tuning are freaking amazing. Like flame graphs. Yeah. Fl yeah. And flame graphs and all the tools and stuff that he releases for that stuff um, are just, are just amazing. I can't, uh, I can't be more grateful for having that stuff available. Well, here's a good opportunity for me to, to slide in a, a little plug. If you like flame graphs, if you like profiling if you like benchmarking you should come to my workshop at gophercon this year because i just opened up a new workshop at gophercon and we talk about brendan Gregg's torch graphs during that workshop so so go buy my workshop i'm gonna go to your workshop i'll be there <laughs> Casey Wilson says if you like flame graphs you might like barbecue that's actually true there is a direct correlation this is not you know scientifically proven but we're pretty sure that there's a direct correlation between frame flame graphs and barbecue that sounds legit. Yeah, it is. Totes legit. So I know we're coming up on some hard stops for everybody. So let's go ahead and wrap up today's show. I want to thank everybody for being on the show. Thank you, Ashley, for coming in and joining us as a, as a co-host. 
Thank you. Huge thank you to Alex for coming on the show and talking to us about Restic and for making me finally uh, get around to setting up backups because it's now easier. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you for curating Restic. What a, what a great application. We appreciate it. Thank you. And a huge shout out to our sponsor, TopTal, for uh, helping make this podcast possible. Uh, definitely share the show with fellow Go programmers, friends, family, all that good stuff. You can subscribe to us on gotime.fm. Follow us on Twitter at gotime.fm. If you want to be on the show or have suggestions for guests or topics, uh, you can hit us up on github.com slash gotime.fm slash ping. Just file an issue and we try to, to track those and get people scheduled. Um, with that, thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Ashley. All right, Thanks, talk to you later. Got to meet him. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Peace out. All right, that wraps up this episode of Go Time. Tune in live on Thursdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time at the changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. Special thanks to TopTal for sponsoring this show. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. This episode was edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music for GoTime is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.